Luke, and this is the call of the first disciples. Um, this story is different in all of the different Gospels. This one's Luke's version. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets, and he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from shore. And he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your notes, your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. But if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish, their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Master Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. And they brought their boats to shore. They left everything and followed him. Thanks be to God for this word to us. So there's a joke about a young farmer who while standing in his field, observes this peculiar cloud formation, and the clouds form the letters G and P and C. And he thinks them a call from God. He thinks those three letters stand for Go, Preach, Christ. And so he rushes to the church, and he insists to the elders at the church that he has been called to preach. And they are very respectful of his ardor, and they invite him to fill the pulpit. And so that Sunday, the sermon is given, and it is long and tedious and virtually incoherent. And when it finally ends, the leaders sit in stunned silence, and finally a wizened elder mutters to the would-be preacher, it seems to me that the clouds were saying, go print corn, go plant corn. In case you hadn't noticed, all of our passages this morning were about calls. Calls from God. Call, the call of Isaiah, call of Paul, and then finally the call of Peter and, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So the concept of call is one of the most basic biblical ideas. The Bible is riddled with stories about calls to men and women who one way or another were prompted, compelled, drawn, and perhaps in some cases pushed kicking and screaming, as in the case of Paul, into the service of the divine. And I'm going to make an assertion right now that is most actually marvelous but perhaps is also terrifying. God has a call for you. Every single person in this room has been called by God to be involved in the process of proclaiming, as Paul puts it, the good news of God's love. That's what God does, right? That's how God rolls. He calls people into service. God called Abraham, Moses, Samuel, David to lead the people. God called Isaiah and Amos and Habakkuk and all kinds of other people to wake people up. And God called John the Baptist and Peter and Saul and later Paul and Barnabas to help usher in the kingdom of God. God is a God who calls people to service. Now as we think about that, one of the things that's really important to remember is that these calls are all God's idea. If you have a call and it's your idea, it's probably not a good idea. It's not like Abraham said, oh, hey, I think I'd like to be the father of a nation. That was God's idea. It's not like Moses thought up the Exodus all on his own. Or that Peter woke up one morning and said, I'm going to drop everything I've been doing my entire life and go wandering off with an itinerant minister. The calls we get to ministry originate with God. 
and our ability to do what we are called to do also originates with God. One of the really interesting things about the calls we see in the Bible is that almost all of those calls are surprising, or at least were given to relatively surprising people, considering the task that they were given to do. There was nothing about Abraham, as far as we know, that prepared him for a life wandering around in the wilds of Palestine. He was, as far as we know, a prince, kind of a pampered rich kid, not a savvy, savvy desert guy. Not the right person to send south to some place in the middle of the desert. Moses was a murderer, impulsive. David was the youngest and weakest of all the sons of Jesse. And as we later know, he had a few problems with boundaries. Isaiah was, by his own admission, a man of unclean lips. Peter was nothing but a fisherman. Paul was an intolerant, brutal killer. When St. Francis once was asked why God called him, he said, God picks the weakest, the smallest, the meanest of men on the face of the earth, and God uses them. God is kind of a weird guy that way. But the point is obvious. It's not our innate, inherent capacity that matters. It's God's call and presence. If God calls, God empowers. Which leads me to the thing that really jumped out at me when I read the story of Isaiah and Peter and Paul. Every single one of these calls involved transformation. If you think about it, right? Isaiah was an unworthy one with unclean lips. He was not a person who should be telling anybody about what to do. And yet, Isaiah was purified, right? He came over with the tongs and got that ember and cleansed his lips, symbolically. Released him from his guilt and shame so that he could write at least parts of that amazing book that we know of as the book of Isaiah. Paul, his transformation was truly profound. He was judgmental. He was cruel. He egged people on so that they killed other people. Not a nice guy. But he was transformed into a person who preached God's love and God's forgiveness, who insisted that God was all about grace and not retribution. And Peter, well, I love the story of Peter's call on Luke, right? We've got this bunch of fishermen, right, coming up empty after an entire night of fishing. And then along comes a carpenter? A carpenter, right? Not a fisherman, who commands Peter, who at this point was still Simon, to let him preach from his boat and then tells him, oh, let's leave the shallows and go out over here. I want you to put your nets down there one more time. Peter was not really very impressed with that, right? Peter was done. He was finished. Hey, dude, we've been fishing all night and we've got nothing. This is stupid. Nothing is going to change. Well, okay, okay, fine. I'll do it if for no other reason than to prove that a carpenter shouldn't be telling me how to fish. But when the nets were dropped, of course, they were filled with fish. So many fish that the nets were in danger of breaking. Two boats were filled, and they barely got back to shore. All kinds of people got in on the abundance of that moment. And so Peter, who was tired and done, who had basically said, why bother, ended up hooked. When God calls, God transforms. When God calls, God gives us what we need. Isaiah needed a new sense of cleansing and relief. Peter needed a sense of empowerment and hope. Paul needed to understand grace and love. 
And in every case, right, God delivered. And in doing so, God gave them a glimpse of what it means to be a child of God. God gave them a glimpse of what it means to participate in the kingdom of God. Isaiah got the release. Peter got the hope. Paul got the love. And that made the call of God irresistible. When they answered the call, even though they were people with issues that come with being human, right? Even though they were sinful, tired, and hateful. When God got done, they were forgiven, hopeful, and graceful. And they ministered out of transformation, and they ministered out of abundance. So their ministries were not about them. Their ministries were about the God in them and about the abundance that God had created in them and about what God had done in them. The irresistible God had filled them and the irresistible God then spilled out of them. The last week or a couple weeks ago, I, I used a quote by Dallas Willard. I'm going to use it again. I love this quote. It's my favorite quote maybe of all time. Because this is what it means to be called by God. Jesus does not call us to do what he did, but to be as he was, permeated with love. Then the doing of what he did and said becomes the natural expression of who we are in him. Answering the call of God is about letting God touch us at that place where we most need to be touched. It is about letting God transform us. And then it is about living the transformation. Being people who take on Jesus and, and becoming the love and living the love which we are given. We are all called by God. Outwardly, that may look really different. Each one of us is called uniquely. Some will preach. Some will teach. Some will bake bread. Some will sing. Some will encourage others. Some will raise crops. Some will balance books. Some will raise and nurture children. Outwardly, we may do very different things. But at the core, at the core, answering the call of God is about letting God touch us, letting God and God's love permeate us and transform us, and then, in a myriad of ways, living that love out, living that transformation. And in doing so, making faith irresistible. I'm going to close with a quote from Madeline Lingle. Another one of my favorite quotes. We draw people to Christ, not by loudly discrediting what they believe, nor by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we are called, that we are asked to be your children and to be in ministry for you. That's going to look different for all of us, Lord, but for all of us it means one thing, that we let you come into who we are, that you let us come into the center of who we are and transform us and fill us and give us abundance. And then whatever we do will be done out of that abundance. And whatever we do will be a ministry that is irresistible because it draws people to the light. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you turn in your hymnals and stand, we're going to close with...